92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by a generous gift in memory of Christopher Lightfoot Walker, longtime friend of 92Y's Unterberg Poetry Center and the Paris Review. This program, part of an ongoing collaboration between the Poetry Center and the Review, features a Writers at Work interview with Robert Fagels. It was recorded on November 24, 1997, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. I thought we would start with the classic Homeric question, um, in the words of uh, Queen Ariti from the Odyssey. Who are you, and where are you from? And after those questions are answered, you usually get some food in the Homeric world, I think. <laughs> but not until they're answered, I think, the story goes. Well, um, I'm the son of a lawyer and an architect, and I grew up outside of Philadelphia um, in a household that was fraught with some illness and filled with kindness. And um, I'm an only child, um, a curse and blessing both, according to the old story. Um, I was educated in public schools outside of Philadelphia, then went to Amherst College for undergraduate work, Yale for graduate work, and I've been teaching at Princeton since 1960. I'm a lifer. Uh, and there I live with my wife, and we have uh, raised two daughters. Um, they cover the real world, one a physician and the other a, a, a marketing analyst, while I've been hanging out in Homer for the last 20 years. And uh, was there anything in in your childhood memories or reading that was a bridge to Greek? I think so, because when I think of what I was read, um, what was read to me. So on the one hand, many kinds of adventure stories, uh, Kipling, Robert Louis Stevenson, um, Fenimore Cooper, when I could understand him. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the newspapers, which were uh, full of uh, the world at war. Mm. And so between the stories of adventure, um, Odyssey and perhaps, and the stories of the world at war, quite factual and actual, uh, the Iliad, if you will, I think there was some kind of bridge to things Greek, now that I think of it, now that you ask me. Well, we'll take you to Amherst now, where you enter as a pre-med, and I'm going to ask you what made you drop the scalpel and pick up Greek. Well, I never really got to the scalpel. Had I got to the scalpel, I might have stayed with things medical. Um, I was stuck in quantitative analysis, and chemistry was not my bag at all. Uh, and I think the more positive answer is that um, I simply acknowledge my love of language and love of reading and love of poetry. And uh, you went on to do graduate work with the great scholar Alexander Pope, Maynard Mack. Yes. What, uh, did you work on together? Huh? We worked uh, together, or rather, I was really his student, and he has always been my mentor, and a wonderful mentor uh, for many reasons. Uh, to speak of Homer, however, um, he would draw my eye to the fine particulars of Pope's translation of Homer, and then expand into Pope's entire epic vision of what Homer is about. Mm. So um, I came early on to know, thanks to Maynard, um, that Pope's Homer was really an original English poem, was really an original English epic poem, mm. uh, of the likes of Dryden's Virgil, Paradise Lost of Milton, and so on. And this was a very important lesson to me. It, uh, it gave me my first inkling of a kind of epic ambition, or what was possible in that line. So you come to, um, to, to Greek, really, as a young adult. And, uh... Uh, yes, in fact, I began late. Uh, I mean by that I began in my junior year of college. And as English friends uh, will always scold me uh, for not having come from the womb fluent in Greek, uh, I've always struggled to catch up. I've always felt behind, and that isn't false modesty, it's just the fact of the matter. And with that perspective, do you, uh, do you think that Greek and Latin, given the presence of Homer in English literature, and especially Homer is seen through the prism of Virgil, um, do you think that Greek and Latin should be taught as a matter of course in the high schools? I certainly do, and if we can't do that, by all means, let's teach him in translation, or teach Latin and Greek literature in translation if the languages can't be captured, yet I think they can. Mm -hmm. So your, your first volume of, uh, of translations was uh, Bacchylides, the choral lyric poet, uh, and that was published in 1961, mm -hmm. followed in succession by the Oresteia, um, a volume of your own poems in the voice of Vincent van Gogh, uh, Sophocles' Theban plays, 
Um, and then Homer. And uh, you've said that there's, there was a sequence there and that there's a natural progression from, from lyric to tragedy to epic. What, what is that progression? I think I see this or say it by virtue of intense hindsight rather than any kind of predisposed plan. But now that I look back on it, I began with lyric poetry, moved to choral lyric, which is the spine of tragedy, and then to what we like to think of as our first tragedy, the Iliad, and then to its necessary sequel, the Odyssey, its comic sequel, not in the sense of something side-splittingly funny, but a kind of return to normalcy and the harmonious. I noticed that you acknowledged Robert Graves, the poet, <laughs> in your uh, introduction to Bacchylides. Um, what was your connection with him? Well, my connection was uh, passing in the night only, and it was a folly of youth, something that I would, I suppose, we would only do in our 20s, if at all. Um, I had a manuscript of uh, this Greek lyric poet I was translating, and uh, I felt kind of good about it for no very good reason, and I sent it to Robert Graves in Mallorca, uh, an idiotic thing to do, um, chutzpah of the worst sort. And back it came by not return mail, but a few days at any rate, uh, with a long letter from the master, uh, pointing out a lot of errors I had made, things gone wrong, and he signed off by saying, uh, pardon me for looking a gift horse in the mouth, but I'd like to prescribe a little dentistry on the way. <laughs> I writhe every time I think of that, but there we are. And uh, have a uh, connection with other poets been important to you? I think very. I've been blessed with a lot of poet friends, friendly poets. Among them, uh, Bill Meredith, and it's grand that he's won the National Book Award, mm -hmm. especially for effort at speech. This fine new book and collected poems, too. Um, Ted Weiss, um, Carolyn Kaiser, Maxine Kuhlman, uh, Charlie Williams, Paul Muldoon. I could go on and on. There, there are many. But let me single out maybe three, and two happen to be poet translators. One is um, Robert Fitzgerald, uh, who was a good friend and confirmed my and most everyone else's notion of what an epic poem might be in contemporary English or modern English. The other is um, Mike Keeley, a friend and poet translator, um, who is really the American English voice of Seferis and the great modern Greek poets, especially Seferis, important to me, and I'm introduced to him through Mike and Mike's great work. And finally, um, Jim Dickey, whom I knew but only in the last two years of his life. And um, something about the rugged ambition of Jim Dickey is something I've always admired, and to have a correspondence with him has meant a great deal. And what was the occasion of your first translation from Homer? Well, I can practically date it as about, at about 20 years ago. My mother died in 1976, and it fell to me um, to gather together a kind of service for her, a set of readings, uh, sentiments, and whatnot. And the first text that leapt to mind is that um, memorable moment in the underworld of the Odyssey. Odysseus hadn't seen his mother for 20 years. He'd left her quite alive in Ithaca before he went to Troy. He goes to the underworld 20 years later and finds her ghost and realizes that she is dead. Uh, that was the text that I thought would be best. And so I tried my hand at turning it from Greek to English. Mm -hmm. And you've cited um, W.B. Stanford's work on the Odyssey as an important influence, and uh, even said that um, uh, he, uh, he told you um, in, uh, on, in County Wicklow mm -hmm. uh, um, um, of, a, of a path back to the roots of Homer. And what, what was that path? Um, Stanford was a great commentator, uh, not only on Aeschylus, but on Homer, and a, a great friend. We worked on the Oristia together. In the case of Homer, um, he felt that the route back to the source lay in trying to capture Homer's energy, Homer's momentum, uh, Homer's performative aspect. And that sounded right to me. And it was something that um, I pursued. Mm. So you um, began your Homer project uh, with the Iliad, which you published in 1990. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about how long it took you for each, uh, for each epic. It's hard to date it exactly or time it, but I think a little over 10 years for the Iliad and a little under 10 years for the Odyssey. Mm, those are good Homeric numbers. Good Homeric numbers. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of uh, Bernard Knox, who, the classicist whom you describe as your collaborator in these works? Well, Bernard is um, not only collaborator, but comrade. Mm 
Uh, he was my teacher and now um, as close a friend as I hope to have, and it's a blessing to have such a close friend as Bernard. Um, I put it uh, that he's a comrade because Bernard is an old soldier and a very great one. Uh, I have never known combat, lucky me, and war is something which is only vicarious uh, in my experience. But to work with Bernard Knox on a translation of the Iliad and to receive Bernard's commentary uh, really shaped the whole poem for me. In everything from my careless use of the word murder, what one soldier was doing to another in the Iliad, and Bernard stopped me short and said, you know, it's really not murder, it's something else. From that one point to an entire tragic, uh, military tragic vision of the Iliad, uh, it shaped the way I come to think of Homer. Uh, and Bernard is uh, someone who lives up to and by the old classical ideal. He's a man of words and a man of action, both. Uh, that's something that I could aspire to. In fact, to compare small things to great, um, Lawrence of the Arabia uh, said of Homer um, that Homer is more an aspiration than a person. I aspire most fervently in him, said T.E. Lawrence. I feel exactly the same way about Bernard Knox. And was there um, also um, uh, an aspect of having just m missed uh, uh, combat in a war? Maybe. Very much. Um, this may sound a little far-fetched, but it's something that, that ever since uh, the New York Times was read to me as a boy, and I followed uh, both the European and the Pacific theaters of World War II, um, it's not so much a hanker to have been a soldier, but it's an intriguing, a fascinating and horrible kind of subject that has drawn my fascination, I must say. Um, and translating the Iliad was in some far-fetched or distant, vicarious way, uh, a way of entering combat, a way of experiencing what many others, somewhat older than myself, have experienced, and Bernard Knox above all. Yes, um, and I, uh, you also spoke about the um, imagining the American Civil War as a path into that Homer song. Very much so. Um, and um, I suppose I think of it that way um, largely because of Shelby Foote's three-volume history of the Civil War. When I began translating the Iliad, my friend George Garrett asked if I knew Shelby Foote's three-volume history, and I said no. He said, well, drop everything and begin to read it. And begin to read it is it, because it's a very long stretch and magnificent piece of writing. Um, at the end of his labors, Foote credits Homer with being a kind of impetus behind his entire history. And when I think of that um, magisterial and defining moment of American history, um, I think of a sentiment expressed best by Oliver Wendell Holmes in his um, Keen New Hampshire Memorial Day speech in 1884. Uh, he was a captain in the Union Army, and the experience meant the very world to him. And he said, um, through our great good fortune in our youth, our hearts were touched with fire. It was given to us to learn at the outset that life is a profound and passionate thing. Life is a profound and passionate thing. Um, that's Homer through and through. Can you take us through a sample working day on one of these translations? Oh, sure. Um, I, have an, I have a relentless internal clock that gets me up very early and gets me to my desk at about 7, 7.30. And the morning is when I would be working at Homer. And um, I suppose the easiest or hardest thing to say is that I would have my Homeric texts and commentaries and dictionaries on this side, and as much as I could remember of English and American poetry in my head or often with a book opened on this side. And there are about 2,700 years that separate the two, and the labor is somehow to bring the two together. And what I would always do uh, would be to read Greek aloud until I could begin to feel or find the English lurking, I thought, between the Greek words, between the Greek lines, mumbling like a maniac, andromoi enepamusa polutrapon hos malapola plangtheapi troyes. Sing to me of the man muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. The two are not equal, obviously. Homer infinitely greater, but trying to work from the Greek cadence some notion of my own English over and over again, for about three hours every morning, I think. I drove Robert Fitzgerald back uh, to the Newark airport after he gave a reading in Princeton, 
and I said fatuously, he was uh, halfway through his Iliad, it's an awfully long poem, isn't it, Robert? <laughs> and he said, yes, Bob, but I wake up every morning with the privilege of having Homer as my companion. I know exactly what that feels like, and it's quite a privilege. Well, Robert Fitzgerald, uh, your predecessor in these translations, um, said that his uh, guide uh, for his language was to remove anything transient from the language, that the test of any given phrase would be, is it worthy to be immortal? You have said that your aim was to bring to life as many voices as possible. Yes. And uh, can you talk a little bit about your sense of Homer's performance? Yes, and I think it has a lot to do with voice and voices. As I read Homer, he's a remarkable combination, not only of the timeless, the immortal phrase, but of the timely. I mean by that that his work is fresh with a vigor as of now. And um, when you think of the Iliad, the Iliad is well more than half dialogue or direct discourse. The Odyssey is well more than two thirds. It is a very, both are very dramatic poems. Both are filled with many different voices. It's as if Homer were a ventriloquist, ventriloquizing his voice into the voice of, voices of dozens of people um, circulating throughout his poem. And I think that one of the most important things to try to capture at any rate is that, um, is that marvelous dramatic sense that he conveys. Whole books, uh, book nine, book 24 of the Iliad, um, books 19 and 23 of the Odyssey, the reunion of the king and queen, could be lifted bodily out of the text and placed on a stage. There are dramas waiting to be performed. And um, does that sense of Homer as performance and not as literature, uh, do you think that differentiates your, your translation from your predecessors above all? I don't know, to be honest. I don't imagine that any translator ever set about to write an unspeakable Homer Though I think that George Chapman came very, very close. Um, but whether mine is more speakable than others, I think I'd rather leave for others to decide. Maybe Catherine Walker and Jason Robards, who will be on with me at 8 o'clock here this evening. Uh, until um, roughly the 1950s, uh, Homer in English has been a pretty British fellow. That's true. Um, is he having an American incarnation now, and why is that? Well, he's still a pretty British fellow. I'd ask any Brit and they will tell you. Um, and in fact, um, much of the currency of Homer derives from um, Christopher Logue's very um, the imaginative uh, kinds of approaches to Homer and solid prose translation, still by E.V. Ryu and uh, as revised by his son and Walter Schuring. Um, the English tend to like their Homer, as they take it, straight, meaning in prose. We tend to like our Homer in verse, and I think that may tend to explain why American Homer, American translations, in fact, are with us. We don't want to subject an ancient uh, poem to what um, might be called the betrayal of prose. We want it to be in some kind of comparable verse, comparable to the great Greek original. And I think it's through that effort to turn Homer into poetry that we come or we stand a chance of coming closer to Matthew Arnold's great counters that Homer is simple, direct, swift, and above all, noble. I think there's much in that, um, and it may very well be that, that Homer is becoming more of an American thing even than an English thing these days. I'd like to think so. One of the traditional problems for a Homer translator has been the, the Homer's rapid movement from the sublime to the low, from Olympus to pails right. of milk with flies swarming around mm -hmm. them, which made Pope wince. And, uh, and he couldn't handle it very well, either. <laughs> um, has being a, an American poet given you a different perspective on that and maybe even been an advantage? I think it has been an advantage, now that you put it that way. Um, I think that uh, we are more agile in climbing off our high horse than certain other practitioners of English. Um, we like variations in tone from the high to the low. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. I think that uh, Robert Frost might even be, I think, what you call a tutelary spirit. There's much about Robert Frost that, uh, that comes to the American Homerist's uh, aid. One is his bluntness that does very well, I think, for the Iliad. Something else is his kind of earthy, ironic savvy that has a lot to do with the pastoral parts of the Odyssey and with the confabulations between Odysseus and the pig keeper. Uh, being an American is something of an advantage. I think especially of uh, when we're writing well, talking well, there are parts of American speech that are uh, 
uh, rough and ready, um, high, wide, and handsome. They're, they can be filled with a kind of burly courtesy. When I think of the quality of burly courtesy, I think that might serve Homer very well. Yes, uh, for me, that's been one of the freshest and most daring elements of your translation is the, um, the refracting of Homer through American voices and uh, in, so, in some ways um, the jettisoning of Shakespeare, whose echoes are, are so strong in other translations, especially Fitzgerald. They are. I've tried, in fact, to stay away from Shakespeare because I feel that the Shakespearean gesture might be too literary, um, uh, too stilted, too poetic in quotes. I think that Homer is more direct, plain, down to earth than that. And um, one of the things I'd like to persuade you or readers of is the proposition that Homer's not a writer, uh, strange as that may sound. There's something almost paradoxical about reading Homer in a book. He's not meant to be read, really. He's meant to be heard. He's meant to be performed, listened to, heard, rather than savored in one's brown study, going over the same passage again and again. What is great in Homer is immediately available mm. through the ear, through the eye, even. On the other hand, is the lack of uh, uh, tradition in American poetry as public speech or public, having a public function been a hindrance? I don't know. I, um, I, think, I think there's probably no tradition of public speech as poetry, but there's an awful lot of great public, speech, uh, public speechifying in this country that verges on poetry. I'm thinking of a variety of things. I'm thinking of Lincoln. I'm thinking of Frederick Douglass. I'm thinking of the voices that went through Ken Burns' Civil War. Um, we're not short on a kind of uh, magisterial oratory. I think of Oliver Wendell Holmes again. Um, so that uh, there not being a poetic tradition of public speech is a complex affair, I think, in the American conscious. Mm -hmm. can, you, um, can you give us a metaphor for, tr for the role of a translator with regard to poet? We have prison, we have marriage, <laughs> we have ghost and medium. Let me tackle each one of those with a twist, if I may. Um, being a translator is to be a prisoner, all right, uh, a prisoner of Homer, which, as I may suggest, is not a bad thing. I mean by that, that if you're a lifer with Homer, a prisoner of Homer, Homer has the gift of occasionally setting you free, releasing you into a larger form of utterance than you might ever have dreamed of. What was the next, marriage? Yes. Marriage. It is a kind of marriage, um, often on the rocks, I must say, uh, when the days go hard and the, and the work won't come and you can't really hear Homer. But um, it can be a good marriage, too, I think. I remember uh, that line in Praise of Marriage that Odysseus says to Nausicaa uh, when he describes two minds, two hearts, that work as one. Uh, that can be the relationship between a translator and his great original. And what was the other? Oh, ghosts. Uh, ghost and medium. Ghost and medium, yeah. Um, there's another one. It seems to me that uh, ghost, indeed, you're a kind of ghost writer. I remember that George, or worse, I remember George Steiner says that when a translator looks behind him, what he sees is a eunuch shadow. And I'm unclear about the physiology, but I know the feeling very well. Um, you are bloodless to some extent. You are a ghost writer for the great master, it's true. Yet you're also like those ghosts in the underworld of Homer. You're, you're sipping the um, magical blood that can animate you, that can give you a voice. Uh, so it's a question of dying, as Keats would put it, dying into life, too, of a sort. But I think my favorite um, metaphor or notion of the relationship is that of uh, actor and role. Uh, that means much more to me, I think. Um, the need to perform Homer, perform Homer in your own day and age. Um, it's, a, it's a role or a relationship it's a kind of boomerang. I'm always asking myself when translating Homer, if Homer lived in the 1980s or 90s, how would he say this or that? Well, given the limits of our language and sensibility, he probably wouldn't have mentioned the wine dark sea or the dawn with rose red fingers, let alone a one-eyed cannibal or a witch that turns men into swine or most miraculous, a marriage that survives 20 years of separation. But at the same time, Homer might insist on those miracles even in the 1990s. And so you experience in that actor and role relationship, you experience um, a contraction and a kind of release. Uh, and if you experience the limits and the liberation fully enough, then you stand a chance of, as the cliche would have it, of 
bringing Homer home. Um, can you, is it possible to give us a, a little psychological portrait of Greek, a little, a little character sketch so that we That's can- That's a wonderful it? tall order. <laughs> Let me um, at least try to describe Homeric Greek in a few words, in a few words. Uh, Homeric Greek is paratactic. It sets things side by side by side. Its favorite ways of joining elements in a sentence is to say and, 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 and. Um, Hemingway mastered this art, as you know. Um, Homer is not only paratactic, he's wonderfully forthright uh, and direct. Uh, he has a wonderful energy and momentum. And more than that, Homer has a metric in him that is terrific, whether he's describing the building of a raft or the hitching up of a wagon um, or the look of a bow or the flight of an arrow. Whatever Homer describes, however homely, however uh, factual, it always comes out poetry. Mm -hmm. To describe my English, at least, on the other hand, and I do mean the other hand, um, my English is not paratactic, it's hypotactic. It deals in uh, causes, in subordinations and insubordinations. Um, my English is not as forthright and direct, it is more understated. Um, my English is not possessed of a kind of momentum, it's more phrase-bound, more clause-bound, more fragmentary. What I try to say is not ever naturally poetry, whether I'm describing the hitching up of a wagon or a long hard sail in the Mediterranean or the reunion of a king and queen. Um, my English and the English I inherit by and large is not poetry until a, until a Melville or a Faulkner has made it so. Now those are brief character sketches, all too brief. Wow, well, I wish we had more time for So longer. do I. Um, well, can you um, can you re remember a, 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 what a powerful moment for you that when uh, when you saw the scope of a translator's choice um, uh, in Homeric Greek and talk about the mystery whereby translations of the same author will inevitably reflect a translator's pre personal preoccupations? Sure, um, I think I had a few things on the mind. Maybe some people might say almost on the brain. Um, I was determined that if I possibly could, I would try to bring out um, the gravitas, the weight and majesty of the Iliad, especially in its more tragic moments. And um, when I came across a line, which is Priam's line to Achilles, I fretted over it a long deal, uh, a long time. It sounds in Greek like this, et lein dohoi putotis epikthonios protos allos, Andros paidophonoio poti stomacher origesthai. And distant English for that sounds something like this. I have endured what no one on earth has ever done before. I put to my lips the hand of the man who killed my son. That in some ways is the great Iliadic experience. Priam wasn't told that he had to kiss Achilles' hands by Hermes who took him to Achilles' tent. It was Priam's impulse to do so. And doing so brings tears to both men, and they have a brief reconciliation because of that. That was a kind of magical moment, I think, that I dwelled on long and hard. Mm -hmm. A comparable moment uh, in the Odyssey, when Odysseus is challenged by Penelope in the next to last book, Penelope saying that um, his bed is quite movable. Well, it's not movable. It's built around the trunk of an olive tree. He knows it, and so should, so should she. So he goes back over uh, what the source of the bed was and how he constructed it and where the olives stood. And when he finishes, he says to his wife, this is our sema, this is the sign. But sema in Greek means not only sign, it also is a mark of identification, even something that contains one's whole life story. So when I come to the end of that passage of Odysseus, it sounds like this in Greek, hu to toi to da sema pifauskomai, udetioida. I expanded a little and uh, came up with there's our secret sign, I tell you, our life story. I felt that the bed held the entire life story of the couple, brought them back together again and ensured their vitality in their reunion. Moments like that. They're small, but in some ways, uh, if they hit you hard enough and you dwell on them long enough, they begin to open up a poem as large as the Iliad or the Odyssey. These, both these epics um, contain battle scenes and love scenes. Um, 
Uh, but in both, uh, the, um, the, the combat is described in intense and inventive physical detail. And noses are lopped off, genitals are mutilated, uh, teeth are knocked out. But when we come to physical love, um, the act of erotic love, um, uh, it's hardly described in any physical detail at all. What, what do you it's make of true. that? It's hard to know what to make of that. We've talked about it before, you and I, and I think I like your idea, too, that um, lovemaking can be described at times in terms of battle, which is a cruel irony, a savage irony. Um, and you also suggested, as, as I remember, that this may be a question of Homeric decorum, a kind of conventionality that uh, prohibits Homer from uh, being as physical about lovemaking as he is about the act of killing. I think that um, if Homer is short on physical descriptions of lovemaking, Homer is very long on dramatic descriptions of lovemaking. And those, I think, are really very telling. And a translator um, may have a way of bringing some of those out, even playfully. Um, Homer doesn't uh, title his books uh, that falls to the translator if the translator wants to do it. In book 14 of the Iliad, where Hera seduces Zeus, I call that Hera outflanks Zeus um, for no very good reason, but, but there it is. Um, I think, too, um, of some great moments which are, in Homer's way, lovemaking. May I read you one? Please. This is the simile that describes uh, the reunion of Penelope and Odysseus and the next to last book of the Odyssey. The more she spoke, the more a deep desire for tears welled up inside his breast. He held, he wept as he held the wife he loved, the soul of loyalty in his arms at last. Joy, warm as the joy that shipwrecked sailors feel when they catch sight of land. Poseidon has struck their well-rigged ship on the open sea with gale winds and crushing walls of waves. And only a few escape, swimming, struggling out of the frothing surf to reach the shore, their bodies crusted with salt, but buoyed up with joy as they plant their feet on solid ground again, spared a deadly fate. So joyous now to her, the sight of her husband vivid in her gaze, that her white arms embracing his neck would never for a moment let him go. I find that very physical. I don't find it, I find it in its own way very erotic. And the turn with which the land to the ship sailor goes from Odysseus's experience to the experience of his wife gives them a wonderful reciprocity, a wonderful mutuality, I think, that I find very moving and, um, as I say, a very dramatic kind of presentation of lovemaking or the approach to it. You've, um, you've said that Odysseus um, is a character who has no consistency whatever, um, that he uh, is cruel as he is tender, uh, innocent as he is um, knowing, um, and, um, and as naive as he is experienced. Um, would you say this is also true of Penelope, or is she a different order of creation? Let me try to answer um, two questions. I never meant to say that he lacks any consistency whatsoever. Uh, let me correct myself and say that what he has is a remarkable completeness. As Joyce put it, he's the all-round man, seen from every possible angle, seen with every possible um, faculty. Uh, the best description of this kind of characterization I know uh, comes from John Crow Ransom, a critic, unfortunately, whom few people read anymore. But Ransom refers to um, the Shakespearean, modern, passionately cherished, almost religious sense of the total individuality of a person who is rich in vivid yet contingent traits, even physical traits, that are not ethical at all. And Ransom concludes that this kind of character, not habitual goodness, this kind of character engages an auditor's love, and that is more than his ethical approval. That's the completeness of Odysseus, I think. That, to that extent, Shakespearean, perhaps. Do I think that Penelope has the same completeness? Absolutely. She goes from a creature of dreams to a hard-edged realist who can plan the contest of the bow, and many, many steps in between. She's a weaver of fabrics, and he's a weaver of plots, and together it's the most natural marriage in fiction. <laughs>
And Gary Wills has written that um, one of the great strengths of your translation of the Odyssey is its entry into the psychological subtlety of the way Homer presents women characters. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to ask um, if you felt that the entry of women into classical scholarship has changed the way we read the classics and translate them. In. I think very much so. Um, and um, I owe a great debt. Oh, I just spoke of that passage about the Sema as Odysseus's bed. Um, I owe much of my feeling about that to um, one of my colleagues at Princeton, Froma Zeitlin, who's one of the leading uh, feminist classicist critics, critics and scholars. Um, I think that feminist criticism by and large has been able to identify exactly what Gary Wills is talking about. But uh, when he s describes the reunion um, of Odysseus and Penelope as the greatest picture in all literature of a mature love demanded and bestowed on both sides equally. I think that equally, that equality, which you sense in the simile in the 23rd book that I just read, that equality, I think, is something as old as Homer. And um, I think that well before feminist criticism came, um, Homer was describing the same kinds of effects. I think what there is, in other words, is a wonderful clarification of Homer's purposes which were always there. There's a wonderful coincidence, and I don't use that in a haphazard way, coincidence between what interests many feminist critics and what um, any translator, especially of the Odyssey, uh, should benefit from. I'd like to propose a paradox for you to comment on. Um, many readers, sophisticated readers, unsophisticated readers, come to Homer and they think um, this is, it feels like the best poetry they've ever read. And yet it takes no special intelligence or training uh, to read Homer. And uh, if you go to Wallace Stevens or T.S. Eliot, you have to have your wits about you. They ask a different kind of collaboration from a reader. But Homer does so much work for the reader beforehand that you, a reader can just bring attention at the outset. So I, I would like to ask, how, how is it possible that this best of poets, whom you call everything, <laughs> um, requires the least of a reader? I'm not sure that it is re that he requires the least of a reader. You use the word, and it's the finely chosen word. What Homer asks of us is attention. And um, it's impossible for one's attention to wander when reading Homer, at least in Greek. The attention is riveted to Homer, line by line, because Homer, for all the seeming simplicity of his effects, is reality incarnate in some way. And in many ways, I think that far from asking the least of us he asks the most of us. That is the most direct kind of participation, line by line, that kind of attentiveness and attention. The one who said this best was Ruskin, who put words in Homer's mouth in Modern Painters. He said that what Homer says is, these are the facts of the thing. I see nothing else than these. Make of them what you will, sorry, make what you will of them. That whole act of making what you will of it, I think requires the utmost attention, uh, in many ways the utmost uh, energy, uh, mental, phys physical, visceral energy um, of a reader or of a listener, mm. the ultimate participation. Well, and here's another paradox. Uh, you've uh, spoken eloquently of Homer as the great poet of the nature of human fate. Um, and uh, I wonder how conscious you were as you as you undertook this work, um, that you uh, as a translator and we as readers are in fact the latest turn in Homer's fate, uh -huh. that he is at our tender mercies. He is at our tender mercy, and I hope the mercy is always tender too. Sometimes he gets some rough treatment, but Homer's so resilient, he always springs back and even, I think, asks for more. It's true that uh, a great poet becomes, in some sense, becomes the later tradition that absorbs him. Uh, to take or twist a notion of Borges, the greatest influence on the Odyssey is James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, and I, I mean that not only half seriously, but very seriously. Um, reading Homer, the, the best aid for my reading of Homer is James Joyce. Uh, he's, the, he's the English writer to whom I would go back and back and back, episode by episode even. And it was through his lens very often that I would be seeing an Homeric episode. Um, Maybe that's not an accurate or a good thing to do, but it was a helpful thing to do. Um, Homer's fate in the 20th century is essentially James Joyce. Uh, not a bad fate to meet up with. You could do much worse. Uh, and it is true that Homer lives uh, as we speak Homer. Uh, 
uh, for those who don't speak Greek, uh, Homer lives in our own language. And that's the last twist of fate. Will the language last or not? Is the language well used? And in many ways, Homer has the last say because the duty of a translator is to try and live up to that kind of uh, vivid, energetic, electrified uh, drama that runs through Homer's pages. Sorry, through Homer's lines and songs, <laughs> not his pages. <laughs> Good, well, uh, moving from the paradoxical to the impossible, is translation a comic activity or a tragic mm -hmm. activity? I should fudge the question and say something of both, or I should answer it probably too simply by saying, when you're translating the Iliad, my God, it's tragic, this activity of a translator. When you're translating the Odyssey, it's wondrously comic. And I mean not only funny, though the poem has its sneezes and its puns and its fools, but there's something restorative about the Odyssey that's peculiar to the comic vision. The return home, and more than home, the return to one's roots um, and rising back to strength and health and wholeness. Well, if we weren't running out of time... I'm sorry we are. I would uh, indulge in a Barbara Walters moment because I uh, happen to know that Bob Fagels is a football fan. Who is a football fan? You are. Yes. And uh... <laughs> Can't keep any secrets. And um, it, would be a, it would be great if we had the time to do it justice to work out a fantasy football team. A fantasy football out team? Out of the Iliad and out the Odyssey. Out of the Iliad and the Odyssey. <laughs> Very good. I know who would be thrown off the team as captain. That would be Agamemnon. He's worthless. <laughs> and what I'd most like as a coach is Penelope. Mm. And I don't mean to be gallant. I'm not half kidding. Yes, just shrewd. Just shrewd. Not as shrewd as she. Well, um, as, uh, we have to turn the questions to the audience, but there's uh, just time to... Thank you, and to Thank you. wish you and, uh, and the audience um, safe homecoming to the Ithaca you long for. Thank you. Okay. There are the lights. Simone Weil once characterized the Iliad as a poem of force. The line that you quoted tonight from Priam about his kissing the hand of the man who had killed his son suggests something quite different. Would you just comment on that? I'd like to say that it is something very different. Her essay is a very great piece of work um, that comes, I suppose, essentially from the time of the fall of France. And much of what she has to say about the geometry of force that characterizes the Iliad. And not only geometry, but severe impersonality of force that makes a thing of people, an inert object, is inevitable and true, and a very tragic reading of the Iliad. She has to go some way, though, to demonstrate that it is in the Iliad, it seems to me. She can illustrate it in the case of minor characters in minor scenes, when it comes to that moment of the reunion, of, sorry, not the reunion, but the reconciliation of Achilles and Priam, brief reconciliation, she notices that Achilles lifts Priam to his feet. He's on his knees. And as Simone Weil describes it, shoves him away, eka, rudely she translates it. It's not what happens in the Iliad. Achilles picks up Priam by his arms and sets him on his feet and gently puts him aside, a ka. It doesn't mean roughly. It means gently. It means full of compassion. And that's really what characterizes the reply that Achilles gives to Priam after Priam has kissed those hands. In other words, it's not a moment of superior force uh, putting down lesser force. Uh, it's a moment of combatants, enemies, uh, embracing, uh, because it is through Priam's kiss to those hands, 
of the man who killed his son, that Achilles sees in Priam his old father, and Priam sees in Achilles his dead son, Hector. Um, it's a kind of working definition of compassion, what compassion really is. Uh, and you have to mistranslate uh, of a Greek adverb. I don't mean to be picky about this, but eka does not mean crudely, cruelly. It means gently. And it's a scene which is uh, suffused with gentleness. The sound of their sobs uh, rise and fall and fill the room. So I think that Simone Weil, placed in an historical context, her essay is a very great one and can reflect, as virtually no other piece of prose I know can reflect, uh, the brutality and the barbarity of the Second World War. But the Trojan War is in some ways a very different story, too. It allows for kinds of embrace, I think, that um, we hear less about in the Second World War. Yes. Have you ever heard a um, heard some of your translations delivered in such a way that made you rethink usage or syntax? Or? I think I'm always rethinking usage and syntax. Um, see, again, um, it's it's the paradox of seeing Homer or a translation of Homer as a book. There's something authoritative and finite about print. When you do the work, you keep on doing the work, and it never stays quite fixed. Um, this is one of the great blessings I have of a wonderful publisher, Penguin Books, that reprints these things uh, periodically, I'm glad to say. Every time they reprint them, I've given it a chance to make some changes, and I'm an inveterate tinkerer. Um, but I think that the hearing is very, very important. Um, when I listen to Catherine Walker, when I listen to Jason Robards, I'm getting a new sense of my own language. I'm getting a sense of where a new stress might fall. I'm getting a sense of where a line might be improved, too. When, when I listen to other actors who've recorded the Iliad and the Odyssey, Derek Jacobi, Ian McKellen, um, I often have this experience. Though uh, what pleases me the most, uh, and it's great good luck, is to find that actors, those who will be on stage at 8 o'clock and those who are in the audio books, seem to hear my cadence as I seem to hear my cadence. And there's a kind of brotherhood and sisterhood that's set up there and a blessing. By that, I mean the application of Homer to contemporary problems, of which a recent example, if you're familiar with it, is a book by the psychiatrist Jonathan Shea, Achilles in Vietnam. I know Jonathan and Shea, and I respect his work. Uh, and it is absolutely true that Homer, um, Homer, is fill, Homer is such reality incarnate that when he describes battle in the aftermath of battle, he describes symptoms which are characteristic of post-traumatic stress, which is what the psychiatrist Shea is illustrating. Um, I would like to see Jonathan Shea's uh, argument go both ways. What I mean by that is Homer can explicate the contemporary world of battle and many of its effects. That's one way. I'd like to see what contemporary battle can tend, can tend to do reflexively about illustrating Homer. Always in these things, I like to see the past and the present cooperating. I think in Shea's work, the past, Homer, goes straight into the present and never comes back to things Greek, things poetic, mythological. Yes, Homer's like combat. Homer's like post-combat. But what is Homer that's not like post-combat? Why, Homer's poetry. And not all post-traumatic stress is poetic. Ask anyone who suffered from it. That's the lesson, if any, or... Uh, that's the illumination that, uh, Homer, that Homer can shed, it seems to me. Even the more important illumination than Homer's accuracy. From Homer's accuracy comes uh, many very great effects, I think. Shea is now doing a book on the Odyssey and um, the sentiments of troops coming home. And I'm sure he'll find that the Odyssey is absolutely correct. <laughs> At the same time, he'll find that very few homecoming GIs uh, speak in hexameters. <laughs>
Hi. Hi. Could you speak a little bit more about how translating Aeschylus and Sophocles prepared you for uh, Homer and what you see the relationship between, uh, between those writers? In many ways, they're very different. Uh, in many ways, um, Aeschylus especially is different with his um, muscle-bound um, coinages of new words, um, his, his wrenching of the Greek language. Um, Sophocles is very different from Aeschylus in his, his very plainness, in his very directness. Um, but both have two things, both have one thing in common. They're remarkably dramatic, Sophocles and Aeschylus. And they, both of them, owe their dramatic roots to Homer's poems. Aeschylus described uh, his work, probably the Oresteia rather than the other plays that are still extant, as uh, scraps from the banquet of Homer. Uh, false modesty, perhaps, on Aeschylus's part. It wasn't given to much modesty. Uh, scraps from the banquet of Homer. Um, Sophocles, and Homer uh, Sophocles and Aeschylus all owe to Homer uh, their dramatic sense. They owe to Homer their, their sense of a character who is dystropolos, who is um, bull-necked, stubborn, and headed for the worst. Um, those are some of the two debts I, I would mention that tend to bind the dramatist together with the great epic poet. Could you comment on the theory that there were different authors for the Iliad? There's something to be said for that, and philology, uh, that is the closest study of the language of the Odyssey on one hand and the Iliad on the other, discovers uh, certain differences in usage. Um, but I think the best educated guess is that the poems were composed in the late 8th and the early 7th century. That means in our terms something like 725 to 675 before Christ. Um, the Iliad somewhat earlier in that period, the Odyssey somewhat later in that period. But I have a hunch that I can never prove, and some other people share my hunch and others detract from it, that there was one Homer and one Homer only. I can't believe that the Iliad and the Odyssey were work of a committee. <laughs> Not even a kind of guild of poets. Um, and I say so because I'm an incurable romantic. And what I mean by that is something that I think Keats would have understood. Um, Keats's highest praise for a poet, he gave it to Shakespeare, was that, po was that Shakespeare's imagination was a perfect thoroughfare, as Keats put it. He could imagine an Imogene equally with an Iago, meaning that Shakespeare could envision a paragon of evil and a paragon of virtue and beauty, and not have any abiding loyalties for any one of them. He could imagine fully because he was not doctrinaire. He was open-minded. And this Homer, it seems to me, this one great imagination, could envision equally a Troy and an Ithaca, uh, an Achilles and an Odysseus and Penelope, and not force us to choose between them, because this Homer has such um, imaginative generosity, tolerance, uh, breadth. Just a hunch, I can't begin to prove it, and there are many people to prove me wrong, too. This woman's question, yes, which is, um, what do you feel or know about him as a human being? Him, her, blind, sighted? Uh, what could you say about Homer? I'd say, I'd say what Pound said about Homer in the ABCs of reading. He describes meeting up with a musician friend, and he says, and the musician friend says, "Tell me, isn't there anywhere where you can get it all?" Uh, as I can get it all from Bach. And Pound confesses, no, there really isn't any Bach in language, but if someone would study Greek long and hard, he could get almost all of it from Homer. I don't know where I say that Homer is everything, but I would stick with that. Um, this may sound sentimental and mawkish, <clears throat> but Homer's the imagination that can capture everything. He's anima and animus. Yeah, he's battle and reconciliation. He is, uh, he is loneliness, and he is embrace. Uh, he's virtually every experience, it seems to me, uh, that is worth preserving. <laughs> <laughs>
I can't think of a one that I've run into, and that includes lovemaking, uh, that, that Homer doesn't include in some rich and memorable way. Uh, he's something like the totality of experience, I think. What would he have been like pe personally? He might have been a dreadful pain in the neck, but I doubt it very much. Uh, and, when I, and when I think of being able to converse with him or pal with him, uh, I'm, I'm intimidated to the point of silence because I would want him simply to tell me stories. I wouldn't want to converse. I would want him to sing. I, I think having uh, arrived at everything, we've come <laughs> to the end of the questions that we can... Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. 92nd Street Y, Unterberg Poetry Center webcasts and access to our archive are made possible by a generous gift in memory of Christopher Lightfoot Walker, longtime friend of the Poetry Center and the Paris Review. For more information on 92nd Street Y and the Paris Review, please visit us on the web. This program is copyright 1997 by 92nd Street Y and the Paris Review.